Actually, I start with a disclaimer. I'm not a coronavirus biologist. I'm uh, the, the, the main purpose of, of my laboratory is to find new therapeutics for <clears throat> myocardial infarction and, 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 and heart failure. But obviously, when in, in, in spring last year, the, the, the pandemic uh, hit hard, there was a sort of uh, call to, 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 to try and, 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 and see if uh, anyone could give a, a contribute. I, mean, I think that this is an, an important lessons we learn, a lesson we learned from the pandemic, that is that uh, the, the, a response to an emergency should always come from science and technology. And, uh, and, and basically, uh, so we started working on, on the coronavirus and we had uh, the opportunity of uh, analyzing samples uh, that uh, were collected from uh, post-mortem analysis uh, of uh, people who died of COVID-19 at the university hospital in, uh, in, in Trieste. This is mainly work of uh, a very courageous at that time and, and, and a very dedicated pathologist, Rosanna Bussani at the University of Trieste. And uh, who continued to, to perform autopsies uh, even during the, the, the hot period in spring uh, 2020, and and uh, uh, with uh, with Rosana and and uh, with Serena at, at ICGB, we started analyzing these uh, uh, samples from all organs with COVID-19. We found that uh, most of the pathology that was pertinent to COVID-19 was uh, strictly restricted to the lungs. So while all organs suffered separately, but the virus was mainly in the lungs. And among the features that uh, were most striking to us were first the thrombosis. So there was thrombosis in, uh, in macroscopic proportions uh, in uh, several patients who died of COVID-19. These are macroscopic evidence of thrombosis uh, in uh, large uh, arteries and veins on the lung. But at the microscopic level, there were thrombosis in 90% um, of uh, patients, including those with uh, uh, non-severe disease and non-hospitalized. Obviously, these, all these patients died eventually, so it's, the, the disease was, in any case, uh, serious. And, uh, and thrombosis was thrombosis of uh, the, 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 the microvasculature in the lungs. All these in reds here are clots that block the circulation in, in, in the lungs. And one characteristic of this thrombi was that uh, they were heterosynchronous, meaning that they were thrombi in advanced stage of, uh, of, uh, of evolution, of fibrotic evolution, like this fibrotic thrombi you see on the right side of the slide. Together with trauma, they were much fresher with the, with the, the red blood cells still on it. And this is a clear indication that there is a trigger from thrombosis that is endogenous to the lung as opposed to these being uh, emboli coming from uh, elsewhere. And a second characteristic that, that was very striking to us was the presence of abnormal cells, and uh, in particular cells with uh, many nuclei that you can see here, sometimes uh, up to containing up to 20 different nuclei. These in biology are known as uh, uh, syncytia. And you see that uh, the, the, there are uh, histological uh, sections in which these large syncytia are very close to uh, thrombi. These uh, stru uh, cytological structures were really uh, uh, peculiar and, and, and uh, highly abnormal. You see, these are big thrombi in, uh, in, uh, in other patients in these, uh, in these autopsies. And then many of the cells of these cytological abnormalities, again, very large thrombi in an alveoli uh, close to uh, uh, vessels with uh, uh, thrombosis. And this characteristic of uh, forming these uh, uh, syncytia is uh, uh, related to the capacity of the spike protein to induce fusion of cells. All coronaviruses bind to a specific receptor and the spike protein needs to be activated, meaning to be cleaved between uh, the portion that binds the receptor and the portion that trigger fusion, the portion that trigger fusion of membranes, so the envelope of the virion and the, 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 the cell membrane, the plasma membrane of the infected cells. Uh, is buried inside the spike protein and to be activated, it needs to be cleaved. And this cleavage in other coronaviruses and in particular in the SARS coronavirus is carried out 
after endocytosis in endosomes. Instead, uh, the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein contains an additional sequence that you see here, this arginine-rich sequence, which is uh, the target of furin. And furin proteases are expressed ubiquitously both in the endoplasmic reticulum and in the extracellular environment. Bottom line, the portion of spike that reaches the cell membrane gets activated at the level of the cell membrane and cells directly fuse to other cells that contain the uh, ACE2 receptor. So spike of the cell membrane binds to ACE2 receptor and then fusion occurs. So these features immediately told us that uh, it was very likely that COVID-19 is not simply a disease due to a virus that infects the cells and then the cells dies because of uh, viral replication, as you would think of other uh, acute viral infection of the lung. So probably COVID-19 was a disease that somehow had to contemplate the fact that the lung contains these spike expressing cells that tend to fuse to other cells. This was in Trieste, the University Hospital and the ICGB, and then we switched to King's College London. This is uh, the James Black Center, which, which uh, uh, hosts the, 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 the School of Cardiovascular Medicine and, and Sciences. And here we set up a very simple system to assess uh, fusion. So basically we transfected cells that express the ACE2 receptor and proteases with a plasmid expressing the spike protein. And then uh, we waited uh, overnight and uh, we observed whether the cells fused. And this is the uh, first experiment we did, which was very terrifying at our eyes because this was uh, really the first experiment we did with this virus. It is an overnight incubation of cells after transfection with spikes. So here on the left side, you see normal cells, the cell boundary are in red, the nuclei are in white. On the right side, you see the same cell culture after just 15 hours expression of spike, which is here in green. You see formation of these very big syncytia. These holes here are probably syncytia that were so large that they detach from culture. This gives you an idea of the capacity of spike to induce a fusion. This is just a five hour time lapse of cells that express a spike in green. And you can see that these cells roam around, touch other cells and then the induced formation of this large syncytia. At the end of the story, you end up with a picture like these ones. So this is a syncytia in which there are many nuclei here in blue, spike is in green, the cell cytoskeleton is, is, is in red. So thinking that in, in, in the lungs and the respiratory epithelium, people infected with the SARS-CoV-2, there is this kind of structure, so then it is quite, quite terrifying. At least it was terrifying to us at that time, still continue to be. Here in London, we have a high throughput screening facility with a completely automated uh, uh, set setup. And we have libraries for uh, FDA and DMA approved uh, uh, small uh, uh, molecules. So we started a screening in which we searched whether there were drugs that were specifically capable to inhibit the fusion induced by the spike protein. So drugs that could inhibit, inhibit the syncytia. In particular, we had two libraries. One contains approximately 1,200 uh, drugs. It's called the Prestwick Chemical Library. Another one uh, has approximately 2,500 drugs. So there are 700 drugs uh, overlapping between the two uh, collections and uh, we screen them for inhibition of fusion. So here the scale is a, a, a Z-score, so standard deviations from uh, the mean. So zero means no effect. Those that are uh, below zero, it means a standard deviations of efficacy. And you see that here, these in red are all drugs, if drugs adopt, uh, drugs that are highly statistically significant in inhibiting syncytia. And to our surprise, the top uh, drug in uh, one of the two collections, the second drug in the, in the, in the, the other collection was a drug called niclosamide. Here you see an example of, uh, of uh, niclosamide ef efficacy. These are big syncytia, if you express spike. And these are instead cells that are still transfected with spike because they're green, but they don't fuse anymore because they have been treated with uh, niclosamide. If you use these drugs, the top scoring drugs, so niclosamide, but also another drug that you use against leprosy, which is clofazimine or salinomycin, which is an antibiotic 
for uh, veterinary use, they also not only block syncytia, but they block viral replication. This is a, an experiment performed in collaboration with the Mike Mellin group here at King's, in which the IC50 of niclosomide against the infectious virus is in the um, uh, low uh, 100 nanomolar uh, range. Obviously, we were very much interested in trying to understand the mechanism for the inhibition of syncytia. For a couple of months, we didn't understand uh, anything about uh, uh, how these drugs could block syncytia. Then uh, we uh, uh, performed the exercise of expressing the drug activity according to uh, pharmacological classes. So each of these dots here is in one drug. Zero means no effect on syncytia. Those uh, that are below zero are highly effective. The highly effective drugs are those on the left side of this red line. And uh, to our surprise, we found that there were uh, among the highly affected drugs, there were five histamine 1 uh, uh, receptor antagonists, 11 antipsychotics, eight antidepressants, and we didn't understand what these drugs had in common until we realized that uh, these are all drugs that block G protein coupled receptor or the category of uh, GPCRs that are coupled with uh, a G alpha Q. So this is a G protein then transmits its activation signal to phospholipase C, which in turn activate inositol 3 phosphate which in turn open up the channels in the endoplasmic reticulum that mediate release of calcium. This is what uh, uh, GPCRs do, and the drugs all block this mechanism. So meaning that if we give the drugs, we should have less calcium in the cytoplasm. So there was somehow an involvement in calcium in the formation of these syncytia. So we teamed up with another group here of, uh, of electrophysiology, King's Juan Burone and his team. He gave us uh, uh, a sensor for calcium in the cells. It's called GCAM6. This is a, a protein that uh, has, uh, is fluorescent uh, uh, with an intensity that is uh, in accordance to the levels of calcium in the cells. So we loaded uh, some cells with uh, this sensor and then co-culture these cells with other cells that uh, express spike on the surface, uh, uh, which are here in red. And see what happens after we co-culture these cells. So the cells start fusing, but each time they fuse, they start flashing green, which means that there is a sudden increase in the levels of calcium inside, uh, inside the cells. It is a, an amazing characteristic of the cell that as soon as they start fusing, they start releasing uh, uh, calcium, and, and so they become green with the sensor. So if you look at an overnight, with an, this accelerated movie, it's like a Christmas tree. So with these cells in, in, in the culture that uh, roam around, they find the cell that expresses spike, this is induces fusion, and they start flashing uh, uh, calcium. You can, you can uh, quantify uh, this, uh, specifically these uh, calcium uh, transients. These are the calcium transients in normal conditions. If you express spike, there is a very significant increase in uh, these uh, frequency and amplitude of these calcium transients. So if you give miclosamide or clofazimine, then you completely blunt, uh, you block these uh, calcium transients. So there is a calcium that uh, is activated by spike and blocked by the drugs. Again, we didn't have a clue of what was the relationship with syncytia until we stumbled uh, uh, on this, on this uh, uh, publication, uh, which uh, uh, is uh, from 2019. And it is a publication from a group in the US who screened the library of 500,000 compounds for drugs that could induce uh, bronchial release. So this was a, in a search for new drugs for asthma. And they found that the top two drugs in the screening were niclosamide and its relative nitazoxanide, which is also very active against syncytia. And these drugs worked because they are the most specific inhibitors of a calcium sensitive chloride channel on the membrane. So basically, these channels is called TMM16, and there are uh, oranoctamine, and there are 10 members of this uh, family of the TMM16 proteins or anoctamine, and they act as, uh, as they are sensitive to calcium, when calcium are present. These channels allow chloride to get out of the cells, 
and they act as scrum blazes. So they allow phosphatidylserine, which is normally in the inner part of the membrane, to be transported into the outer part, the outer lifterlet of the membrane. So we search whether these uh, anoctamines or cysteine proteins were expressed in the cells that undergo fusion. We found that in particular, one member that's called TMM16F is present in all the cells that undergo spike dependent fusion. And we were very excited by this uh, finding because basically in biology, there is not a single cell fusion event in which uh, phosphatidylserine externalization or TMM16 proteins are not involved. For example, macrophages fuse into uh, giant cells because of uh, uh, phosphatidylserine. Myoblasts, they fuse into myopus in skeletal muscle. There is a TMM16 protein involved. The, the placenta, uh, cytotrophoblasts becoming syncytiotrophoblasts require specific TMM16F. And in fact, if you take cells that fuse and, uh, and, and, and you look at phosphatidylserine exposure by annexing 12, you see that uh, you provide calcium, then you have a strong uh, expression of uh, Externalization of this serine, you knock out TMS16F, you block completely this. So basically, the model became a more uh, complex, but also more meaningful. So there is calcium induced by spike. Calcium activates TMM16F and other members of the family, and these uh, release phosphatidylserine on the outer membrane. If the model is correct, if we knock out TMS16F, we should block fusion, and this is exactly what happens. Big syncytia in controls, if you give an sRNA against H2 to block the receptor, cells don't fuse anymore. If you give an sRNA against m 6 f cells don't fuse anymore. So basically, this uh, uh, work has uh, discovered a new mechanism that uh, controls syncytia inside, induced by the spike protein. And basically, the drugs that we have discovered uh, either block calcium, and so they block indirectly activation of these channels, or in the case of niclosamide or nitazoxanide, they block directly the function of uh, these uh, uh, channels. The reason why we believe that uh, this mechanism is very important, it is because in COVID-19, there are several unknowns. So for example, it is unknown why there is a happy hypoxia and there is rapid worsening of lung function. This is uh, uh, reminiscent of edema in the lungs. There is a, we don't know why there is platelet deficiency and, 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 and thrombosis. Well, I mean, uh, activation of TMS 16 proteins, uh, uh, it means activation of channels for chloride, and chloride is the main determinant of edema. And in fact, uh, if we give a, 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 a spike to the cells, they start releasing uh, chloride. These are uh, chloride currents measured by, by Juan Burone and his team. If we give an SRNA against MFF, MF16F or niclosamide, we completely block this. And uh, even more relevant, uh, MF16F is the main scramblase that is required for activation of platelets, in particular the uh, pro-coagulant function of uh, uh, platelets. If you look at these thrombi that are in the lungs of infected individuals, they have plenty of activated platelets in the thrombi. And so we teamed up with Tim Warner here at Queen Mary University in London and, uh, uh, and uh, um, uh, exposed the human platelets to virions with a, uh, on the surface containing spike of uh, another physiogenic protein, VSVG. And in the case of spike, we see a strong increase in the capacity of platelets to activate and uh, to uh, um, uh, be a substrate from uh, the thrombing uh, generation. So this is a difference between VSVG and, uh, and spike. You see it also visually, you see if you provide spike to platelets, they undergo uh, massive uh, uh, aggregation. This is a coagulant, uh, procoagulant activity of platelets. If you give niclosamide, you completely blunt this. This is a difference in the uh, aggregation and, uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, clot formation by platelets uh, induced by spike after 45 minutes. And this is what happens if you give niclosamide. So we believe that niclosamide is a very interesting drug because uh, also uh, for the inhibition of uh, thrombosis in the lungs. This is a drug that was developed in the 50s as a drug against males. Then in the 
Uh, AETs uh, was approved for uh, uh, human therapy against uh, tapeworms. And, uh, and uh, based on these findings, we have collaborated with the government of uh, India and CSIR and a company in India called Laksa Life Sciences and, and launched a clinical trial that is currently ongoing for uh, uh, niclosamide. We will know the results of these trials uh, uh, very shortly. This is a trial in hospitalized patients uh, with COVID-19 to test uh, for the uh, block of progression of uh, uh, their clinical status as a, as a primary endpoint. So this work was, was performed, uh, uh, started during lockdown period, has continued until now. Uh, the, 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 the work on fusion is the work of uh, uh, five very talented uh, and, uh, and, and brilliant investigators with, uh, with whom I had the privilege to work during the entire lockdown period. Luca Brava, uh, Ilaria Secco, Elena Chiavacci, Ashinali, Antonio, Antonio Cannata. The work on platelets uh, has been contributed mainly by uh, Ambra Cappelletto. Uh, uh, more recently. It is a work that is uh, truly uh, collaborative, uh, in, in involving uh, the essential contribution of Rosanna Bussani, Chiara Collesi, who did all the characterization of uh, the uh, histology, Serena for uh, all the coordinations for, for the, the, the histology part and for an essential intellectual contribution, Lorena for the analysis of the virus uh, Edoardo for, for in, uh, in situ meditation that I show you for the presence of the virus. And then uh, the various groups here in London, the Imperial College, King's College and, and, and Queen Mary. I think this is also an interesting example on uh, how advancement of science can be rapid if uh, there the is really a spirit of, uh, of team working. And that was my last slide and I thank you very much for your kind attention and happy to take questions there is time.